There we go. Okay. Well, now that we've resolved all technical difficulties, I apologize for uh, basically everything here. So um, what wound up happening is I wound up uh, starting a, a little bit too soon, and then I actually wound up bouncing somebody else off and like, okay, fine, I'll give it a couple minutes for people to connect. Um, and then what I realized is I'd been setting up a couple of things to, uh, to stream, and one of them involved unplugging my microphone, and I forgot to plug that back in, thus the no sound. So it Based on the uh, the chat window, everybody can hear me. Now we're ready to get going. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you happen to be. My name is Christopher Harrison. Uh, you can find me basically everywhere online as Geek Trainer, which I will put into the uh, little chat window right there. Uh, and uh, basically my role these days is to help students get up and running on Azure and to talk about a lot of, well, just kind of cool things that we've got uh, going on inside of Azure. And so today, what I want to talk about is one of my favorite things, which is cognitive services, and in particular, computer vision. Now, one thing that I want to highlight before we get going here is the fact that cognitive services are basically a whole host of uh, different products and so forth that are available to you to be able to quickly incorporate AI into your applications that basically there's a lot of very common problems that are out there. And there's a friend of mine that likes to say that we're not launching rockets here. And the point that he's making when he says that is the fact that whatever it is that we're trying to do, chances are somebody else has wanted to do that, uh, to, to do that as well. And so instead of going off and creating our own thing, let's use something else that somebody else has already built. And this is where cog services or cognitive services comes into play, is that these are a whole bunch of services that help us solve some of the most challenging yet most common problems in the AI, in the ML space. So for example, one of the most common things that we're looking to do is to extract information from an image. We might be looking for text, we might be looking for a description, things like that. Or we might be looking for the ability to convert from text to speech or from speech to text. Now, in theory, it's possible to go off and start creating your own models to, to do this. And, and that's all well and good, and, 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 and you could do that, but it's really difficult. So let's not do that. And instead, let's take advantage of the tools that really, really smart people have already built for us. That, for example, one of the services that I've used quite a bit of um, has been under uh, language here is uh, language understanding, natural language understanding, or specifically our little service called Lewis. And I've actually worked a fair bit with the Lewis team, and they basically do nothing but eat, sleep, and breathe natural language processing. This is what they do. And I don't think I could create something that's better than what they've done. So instead, I'm going to use theirs rather than going off and trying to create my own. And so the service that we want to take a look at today is a little thing known as computer vision. And so if we head on over to, I'm getting there. This is, I know this is about computer vision. We're talking a little bit about cognitive services because this is part of cognitive services. That what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to set the stage and explain why it is that we want to be interested in computer vision here. So let's talk a little bit then about, uh, about computer vision. So what computer vision will allow us to do is it will allow us to analyze content inside of an image. So 
What we're able to do with computer vision is get a lot of very common questions answered about an image that, uh, that we might have. So for example, we might wanna be able to get the text out of it. We might be able to, might be looking to get a bit of a description out of it, etc. And so if I actually just scroll down on the, uh, on the little page here, and you can get to this by the way, but just going out and doing a real quick search for um, computer vision, I'll actually uh, paste this into the uh, into the chat so that way you can uh, you can see this so what you're going to notice if I scroll down to the little example screen is they've already got an image that's there for us and you can see all of the really great information that we can get out of an image. And we're able to do this without having to go off and create our own models or do anything like that. That really, all we're gonna have to do, as we're gonna see, is just call an API. And then out of that API, then we're gonna be able to get things like the description. We're gonna be able to get things like the tags out of it. We're gonna be able to see all the different objects uh, that might be inside of it and where those objects exist on an image. Now, one big thing that I do wanna highlight about computer vision before I start going in and showing off a couple of demos is the fact that computer vision is basically a black box, that there is no training computer vision that you're gonna pass up an image, you're going to call a particular API, you're gonna get some response back, and that's gonna be the end of it. And so you might be wondering, okay, well, what happens if it's not able to detect a particular type of image that I'm looking for? Or what happens if there's something else that I'm trying to do on images that it's not able to pick up? Or to put it another way, what happens if I want to be able to train this? Well, if you want to be able to train this, this is where a tool like Custom Vision comes into play. So if you want to take advantage of a model that's already been created, but have some level of control over it, this is where Custom Vision comes into play. And so if you take a look at Custom Vision, they have a little bit of an example here um, where somebody went around and took a whole bunch of pictures of different soda cans that had uh, different uh, varieties on them and then went in and trained up a model based on that. And this is basically what you're able to do then with Custom Vision is that you could go off, take a whole bunch of pictures and classify them all through a UI that while yes, there's an API to be able to upload images and, and, and so forth, you can actually do this all through a UI. And so it's a really nice way to involve your, your business users, uh, people who are maybe less technical, and get them to help you in training the model so that way you're not having to go off and do it um, uh, all on your own. Okay. So um, there's a, a little question here that asks, if we provide the API several images of the same object uh, several seconds apart, will it increase the quality of recognition? So that all depends. Um, the answer to that is if you're using computer vision, sorry, let me change that real quick. The answer to that is if you're using custom vision, yes. And in fact, that's the exact way that you want to train up custom vision that if you're using custom vision, you are going to be training up your own model. So if you think about how you might train up a model in the real world, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you've got some level of variety, and the more variety that you can give it of the same item, the better that it's going to be. So, so different angles, different shading, different lighting, etc. all of that's going to make a difference. In the case of computer vision, however, which again is what we're, uh, what we're here to focus on, in the case of computer vision, the answer to that question is no. That with computer vision, this is a pre-trained model. It's a black box. We're not, unfortunately, going to be able to train it. And so you will then have a little bit of a trade-off. 
If you're looking for generic information out of an object, computer vision is exactly what it is that you're looking for. And if you're looking for like a little bit of a workflow here, always, always, always start with computer vision. See if it will do what you're looking for, that you'll notice, that like if I click on, on Satya Nadella here, um, you'll notice that will actually give me a lot of, of uh, great information out of it. And I wanna highlight this little spot right here of Satya Nadella wearing a suit and tie. So you'll, you're gonna notice that it's not perfect, no model is ever perfect, but it's giving me a lot of great information about the picture here. And again, this is completely done without me having to train up anything at all, that this is simply the way that it's built. So start here, and then if that doesn't work, then go ahead and take a look at custom vision, then go ahead and take a look at how you might be able to then uh, do this all on, uh, all on your own by using the, uh, the, the computer or using the, uh, the custom vision and training up the, uh, the model. So hopefully that, uh, that answers your, uh, your question there. Okay, now, one of the other big things that uh, that I want to highlight, and it's actually why I um, I start with uh, this little tool here, is the fact that you can actually upload your own pictures, which is what I'm doing in the uh, in the background here, and have it give you the results from that picture. So without me having to write any bit of code, I'm now able to test this and see, hey, is this going to be able to do what it is that uh, that I want? Okay, so what I want to now start building towards is I want to create a console application that's going to be able to give me information from this picture. So I want a description from this picture, and I also want the text that's on that picture. Now, in order to do this, we are going to need uh, a couple of different components. And the first thing that we're going to need here is we're gonna to need to set up a key inside of Azure. So you will need to have um, an Azure account. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna create my, uh, my key here and I'm going to um, just simply create new resource and then I'm gonna type in um, cognitive, if I can spell cognitive, cognitive services. Okay, now, the option that I want when I type in cognitive services here is cognitive services. And what this will give me the ability to do is to create what's known as a cognitive services uh, all in one key. So I'm able to use this key for a whole host of different services. So I'm just gonna click on create, and then it's gonna ask me for a name. So I'm gonna call this um, stream demo because I'm super creative in my, uh, in my naming. I'm gonna specify a location here of, in my case, West US 2. Now, where this region is should be close to wherever your application is going to be running. So since I'm gonna be running this from a local application, then I should absolutely make sure that this is in West US because I'm currently in Seattle. However, if you're going to be, say, deploying this out to Azure with maybe like a website, then what you wanna do is make sure that all of your resources are inside of the same location. Now, I'm gonna choose a pricing tier of S0, which is actually the only pricing tier that, uh, that I have, but I do wanna highlight the fact that the pricing is all right here. And so you're gonna notice that on the, the, the quote unquote most expensive end here, uh, which would be if you're making fewer than a million transactions, it's $1 US per thousand transactions. Or if you do the math, it's a penny for every 10 transactions there, which is really nice. Okay, so let me come back over here to create. I'm gonna create a brand new resource group. Again, I'm very creative in my, uh, in my naming here. I'm gonna click on okay. I'm going to uh, confirm the, uh, the little option here, and then I'm gonna go ahead and click on create. And let me just give that a second here to do its thing. Okay, now 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on uh, go to resource here. And I'm doing something else behind the scenes while I'm doing this, which is I'm deleting this resource group. Now, what you're going to notice here is that now on the screen is the key and the endpoint. Both of those are going to become important. You would normally want to go ahead and copy both of those out to, uh, out to Notepad somewhere. Which also, by the way, brings up another really important point. This key right here, this key right here is a password. You should never have this in clear text. You should never, for example, be doing a broadcast like this with that key there. Now, you're going to notice that I'm leaving it up. The reason that I'm leaving it up is because I'm literally deleting the resource behind the scenes. So the key is not going to do anybody any good here. But you do want to make sure that you protect that key. And we'll show off in a few minutes how we can protect that key when we're creating our application and make sure that we don't accidentally check this into source control here. So normally at this point, what I would do is I would go ahead and copy the key and I would copy this endpoint. Now, this endpoint here then sort of implies something. It means like, hey, we've got something that we could go ahead and, and call. And, and in fact, we can. And there's actually a couple of different ways that we can now call this endpoint that we've created. One way that we could do this is by making REST calls or making HTTP calls or HTTPS calls, depending on, on how particular you want to get about the, uh, about the verbiage. And what's great about it is that it's then just like making any other HTTP or HTTPS call that, uh, that you might ever be creating. So you can then incorporate this into any type of application that you might want. So as long as it has internet access, then you'll be able to uh, access this from any type of app. So it could be a mobile app, it could be a web app, could be whatever it is that, uh, that you might want. But you would also notice that there's a whole set of SDKs as well that are available. And there's SDKs available for cognitive services in .NET, in JavaScript, in Java, and in my personal favorite, Python. And that's what we're going to be taking a look at here. Now, there really is, at the end of it all, no difference between making a REST call and making uh, a call through the SDK as far as performance or functionality or anything like that. It really just comes down to a matter of personal preference. For me, I always like to do it um, whenever possible through the SDK, just because then I can take advantage of things like IntelliSense, and, and it just makes it easier for me to go ahead and, uh, and call. Now, the example that I'm going to be working through is actually going to start, let me refresh my page here, with this little, um, GitHub repository that I went ahead and set up. So let me go ahead and uh, share this out. And um, what you could do if you decide, hey, I want to follow along behind the scenes, or maybe I want to go check this out later on, is you can go ahead and clone this repository. This has both the starting point and the end point. So I've got the starting point checked in. You're gonna notice there's a neat little branch here. This has the ending point. And so if you wanna go ahead and take a look at all of this later on, then um, uh, then you could go ahead and uh, and do that. It's all right there for uh, for you to go ahead and um, uh, and use. And this is what, uh, what I'll be using in, uh, in just a couple of moments. There's a question that came in here says, can we use one key or endpoint for different cognitive services? Um, and the answer to that is yes. That with this cognitive services one key that, uh, that I've created, you're able to use that to access a whole host of different cognitive services that are listed here. There are a couple that it doesn't work for off the top of my head. I know that it doesn't work for Q&A Maker, and there's like one or two others that unfortunately I just can't 
can't remember um, that it doesn't work for, but it works for almost all of them. Um, and so that makes it really nice to be able to, uh, to you know, just make your life a little bit easier. Same endpoint, same key, multiple services. You don't need to run around and create uh, different items. Now, I do want to throw one little caveat on that, um, which is to say that if you are using this one key, there is no free version that's available. It's always going to be the paid version. Um, so do keep that in mind. Uh, we've already highlighted the uh, the pricing here and I'll, I'll let you kind of uh, go in and uh, and take a look at all of that uh, from, uh, from there. Okay, cool. Just a little water. Okay, now, you all came here for code, so let's go ahead and take a look at code. And let me make sure that this is choosing the right window. There we go. Okay, cool. So let's take a look at what I've got here. So what I've done is I've already cloned my uh, repository behind the scenes, and I've already opened up the folder inside of uh, Visual Studio Code. So now what I want to do is I want to walk through the normal main steps that you would use if you're going to be using these APIs. And so the first thing that you're going to want to do is to install a couple of different Python packages. Now, the two that are actually really important up here are computer vision, which is going to give us the SDK that, uh, that we're going to be using. That's a little bit too big. There we go. Um, so we've got computer vision. That's going to give us the SDK. And then we're also going to use this little helper called .env. And what .env will do for us is it will allow us to store key value pairs inside of a separate file. So that way we don't accidentally check them into source control, which we always want to make sure that we don't do that. Um, and so we'll actually go in and create a little file to store all of those, uh, all of those values. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a virtual environment. Now, I'm using Linux behind the scenes. That's why I'm using Python 3. Um, if you're using Windows, everything would actually be the exact same, um, only you're not going to say 3. It's just simply Python. And this is creating a virtual environment, which is basically just going to be a folder where all of my packages are going to be installed into. So let me go ahead and activate that. And then let me go ahead and do my um, installation. There we go. Uh, whoops. Okay. Now, while that's uh, doing its um, uh, its little thing in the uh, in the background here, and it actually installed all pretty quick, I do want to highlight the fact that over here on my browser. There we go. Over here on my uh, GitHub repository, you are gonna notice that all of these setup steps are listed right here. So that way, if you're not following along with the, uh, the, the setup, all of that is actually just fine. You can go ahead and, um, uh, and just follow along with the, uh, with the steps that are on the, uh, on the repository. Okay, back over here to, uh, to code. I've gone ahead and I've installed all of the uh, all of the appropriate uh, packages. Okay, and of course, I'm getting the little warning message about uh, doing the installation of um, uh, of pip, and well, you always get that. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about .env here. So I'm going to zoom in really big here, just so that way you can see it. Here's what I'm doing. I'm creating a .env file, and this .env file is going to have all of the key value pairs 
for the different settings that I'm going to uh, to be looking for. So I want to set up a cog um, svcs underscore client URL equals and then cog svcs um, svcs uh, key. Okay, and I'm going to put in my my key there once uh, once I get that created. Now. What you're going to notice is that I'm going to set that client URL to be that endpoint. And then I'm actually going to paste in the key behind the scenes. I'm actually going to do that off screen. So that way that's not going to, uh, to be displayed out. Now, you might be wondering at this point, well, why in the world are you spending all of this time talking about .env? And the reason for that is because so many people check keys and passwords and other things into GitHub. And I really do like to always show off best practices. So because of that fact, I want to make sure that, um, that I'm always walking through the, uh, through the best practices there. Um, because I don't want anybody to be, uh, to be making mistakes and checking things in when, uh, when they shouldn't. Okay. Now behind the scenes, I've already set up um, the, the key inside of .env. So no, I'm not going to open that file back up again for obvious reasons. So now let's go ahead and start coding. And I'm going to build this out from scratch here. So I'm going to say console.py, um, which already exists. There we go. And uh, let's go ahead and, uh, and start writing some code. Let's, let's grab everything that we want. So I'm going to grab um, OS. Uh, which I'm going to need to read in system variables. I'm going to go grab um, from .env um, import load um, .env. I'm not sure why that's not showing up on my IntelliSense, but but that's all right. And then I'm going to go ahead and grab um, from the uh, Azure libraries two um, uh, big items. The first is going to be the computer vision client. And this is going to be the endpoint that we're going to be using. And then I'm also going to go grab the um, uh, oops, uh, import uh, my, uh, my credentials object. OK, so those are all the classes that, uh, that I'm going to need. I'm going to now go grab all the values from my .env by saying load.env. And now I'm going to go ahead and set up um, my um, uh, system variables. So I want to go grab the key. And I'm going to do that by saying os.getenv. Uh, and then this is going to be our cog svcs uh, key. And then I'm going to go ahead and say my endpoint equals os uh, get env, and then my cog svcs client URL. OK. So that's that key and that URL that we saw a couple of minutes ago inside of our uh, browser window. Uh, that's now what I'm pulling in right here. And I'm going to use this, um, first of all, inside of a credential. And then I'm going to actually now set up my vision client. And this wants my endpoint and then that credential. OK, now all of this is really boilerplate. So what I've done here is I've grabbed all my values from .env. I've gone ahead and read in my now environmental variables. And then I've set up the credential. This is basically that password that's now going to allow me access to, um, uh, to cognitive services. And then I've set up my client. This is now going to allow me to make my calls. The client wants to know the endpoint, and it wants to know that key. I've now got all of that set up, and now I'm ready to start making some calls. And this is where a tool like Visual Studio really shines. Because now you're going to notice that I get IntelliSense. And now I can start to see all of the different things that are available to me inside of this uh, inside of this cognitive service. 
So you'll notice that I've got things like analyze image. You'll notice that I've got things like describe image. And all of those are really the operations that we saw a couple of minutes ago inside of the browser. So if I bring the browser back up here, um, where are you, where are you? Ah, there it is. Oops, nope, 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 that's not what I wanted. Um, why can I not find the one that I want? Did I close the window? I didn't. We're really cooking here. Okay, I do not know why it's not showing up inside of my stream tool. That's funny. Okay, um, in any event, what should have happened, what I should have been able to do, is open up the uh, the browser window uh, that shows off cognitive services. And what you'll notice on that uh, little sample screen that I was showing you earlier is that all of the operations that we're able to call are all right there on that screen. And so I really like using that actually as a dev tool that if I'm ever not sure about what properties or values or otherwise are available to me, then I can actually just go back to that little screen and then see what the JSON result is because it's that JSON result that's now going to show me everything that, uh, that I have here. So if I come back over here to the, uh, to the client, one of the things that you're gonna notice is that I've got the option to describe an image or let cognitive services describe the image. And I can do this by either passing up a URL or if I have a stream, then I can just go ahead and pass up the stream. And fortunately, Python actually gives us a very nice little helper tool to go grab a stream. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say with um, open, and then I'll say my uh, sample.jpg, and then I'm going to specify rb, r for read, and then b for bytes as image. So now I've got a stream. And now I can pass that stream into this client. And, and this is, you know, yet another great advantage to using the SDK here is that the SDK can now meet me where I'm at. I'm already using Python. I'm already here in the file system. I've got a stream. Let me just, you know, send this up here. And so that's exactly what, uh, what's going to happen here is I'm going to say description. Oops. Um, there we go, equals, and then I'm gonna say my client, and then I'm gonna say uh, describe image in stream, and then I'm just gonna pass in that stream right there. And then I'm just gonna do what uh, uh, we would typically do on a demo, is I'm just gonna print out what we got so that way we can see where we are. So let's go ahead and save this, and let's come back down uh, here, let me clear this out. And then now let me go ahead and Python 3. Um, and then let's run uh, that little uh, console pie. Okay. So now what this is doing behind the scenes is it's actually uploading that image that we saw earlier and getting cognitive services to describe that for us. So what you're going to notice is here is that result. So you'll notice, for example, that it's giving us a whole bunch of different tags. We're also going to notice that it's going to give us back a collection of possible captions here. Now I'm going to start off by taking a look at the uh, the tags here. Let's go ahead and say for tag in description tags. And then let's go ahead and print out each tag that's inside of there. We'll go ahead and rerun this. And now there's all of the tags and all of these are generated by computer vision. So it's looking at that image and going, hey, these are all the, the different things that I see. So it's, it's picking out a couple of colors. It's picking out the fact there are people there. It uh, uh, detects the fact that it's a sign. It detects the fact that there's a building. And you're also gonna notice again, that this is always going to be a bit imperfect, that it's picking up things like traffic, 
And if we go take a look here, there really isn't necessarily traffic, but you can start to see why it might think that just based on the other things that are going on inside of uh, inside of that image. Um, same thing kind of with city. Again, you know, it's seeing a lot of people, it's seeing multiple signs, things like that. It's like, okay, we can we can definitely understand why it's it's making uh, those uh, those types of assumptions there. Now, one other very big thing that we can do with computer vision is we can also get this to describe our image. If you're a web developer, one of the biggest things that you want to make sure that you do whenever you have an image on a web page is provide alt text for that. Um, and part of that is for those who are vision impaired, because when they go to your page and there's an image there, the screen reader is then going to read out whatever is on that image. So we want to make sure that there's something that the screen reader can, can work with. On top of that, for SEO, if your uh, crawler is coming along and it sees, oh, look, there's an image, then we want to make sure that we can describe that image. So then that way, when somebody goes in and they do a search, it's searching based on everything that's on the page. It's not going to be able to index your image otherwise. Now, in a perfect world, every image that you put on the page is going to have human-generated alt text. Failing that, though, we can get a machine to do it. So let's go ahead and get some possible alt text here. So let's go ahead and say print. I'm just going to put it right down here. And I'll say my description. And then uh, it's actually a collection of captions. It's possible there might be multiple. In my case, I know there's only one, so I'm just gonna grab that one. But let's go ahead and grab um, uh, grab that, and then we'll go ahead and say text, and we'll just print that out. And let's go ahead and run that. Give that just a moment. While that's doing its thing in the background, I do wanna highlight that if you do have questions along the way, by all means, feel free to ask. I can absolutely answer questions as, um, uh, as I go here. Okay, so now what you're gonna notice down here at the very bottom is there is that alt text that it picked up. So there's the description, there's the caption that it's now come up with of a sign in front of a building. Okay, again, not perfect, but this absolutely could fall under the category of good enough. One other very big thing that we're able to do is to actually pick up text from an image. So let's come back over here and let's say result text equals and we'll say client and then we'll say recognize printed text. You're also going to notice that there's a uh, recognize text and this can actually do handwritten text, if you so desire. So I'm going to say printed text in stream, and I'm going to pass up that, uh, that image again. I am going to make sure that I reset the image here. So that way we go back to the beginning, and we can send that back up again. OK. You know, that's a great question. So the question is, did I pre-train this image? And the answer to that is 100% no. Um, I've used this image a ton, just as my demo, but computer vision is a black box. This is 100% just based off of what's inside of computer vision, that I did not do anything uh, fancy or otherwise um, to, to make all of this happen. There we go. Now you're seeing the, the alt text down at the bottom. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. Um, this is just gonna take me a little bit of uh, code here. Give me one second. Uh, for region in uh, result text dot regions um, for line in region dot lines. Um, okay, so when you're doing um, text recognition from an image, um, if you think about an image and you think about text that could be on there, there could be a lot of text. So what's gonna happen with the recognized text is it's gonna give us back a collection of regions. And then in each region, there's gonna be a line. And then inside of each line, there's gonna be a collection of words. 
So unfortunately, there's just a couple of lines of code that we need to execute to be able to get all of this information back. That what we need to do is we need to go through all the regions, we need to go through all the lines, and then eventually we need to go through all of the words. And that's gonna be this last, um, uh, this last bit here. Uh, Okay, let me just, before I talk to it, let me just run my code here real quick, uh, make sure that uh, all that's uh, working. And hello to everybody that just came over from the uh, Visual Studio channel. Okay, cool. So um, here's what you're gonna notice, is now down here at the very bottom is I've got the uh, chance. And if we take a look at the, uh, the image, sure enough, that's exactly the main text that's on there. So it's a little bit of code, and, and if you wanna say, hey, you know what, Christopher, that's, that's a little bit clunky, I'm not gonna to argue too much with you, um, but the reason that there is this level of clunkiness is the fact that there's a lot of, of text that could be on there. So for example, one of the things that I see a lot of like students do with this um, is they'll want to be able to like read a receipt um, and if you think about a receipt, there's there's a lot of text that's on there and it's in different places and so forth and so on. And there's not necessarily a neat way for an API to be able to give that all back to you. And so that's why it's in a couple of different spots. So it just takes a little bit of work to now bring all of that together. And so that's um, uh, that's what's going on there. So yeah, it's a couple of lines of code, but but think about this. That one, two, three, four, four lines of code, um, you know, outside of the boilerplate code, um, and even if we count the boilerplate code here, let's just count the whole thing, all right? Let's, let's, let's do that. Um, I have, counting white space and comments and everything else, I have 31 lines of code. I want everybody in here to stop and think about how they would put together an ML model that could actually do all of this. That's a lot of work. Think about that. Think about the number of images that you're gonna need. Think about the, the amount of code that you would have to write to do that. And in 31, quote unquote, 31 lines of code, I've been able to get a caption for an image, I've been able to get tags for that image, and I've been able to do optical character recognition or OCR on that image all in 31 lines of code. Now, I mentioned at the outset that we can pull this into any type of application. In my case, I did a console app. But you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute, Christopher. What, a, what, what about a web app? Well, that's a great question. I'm so glad that you asked that. What about a web app? Well, let's take a look at a Flask app, shall we? So what I've got here is I've got a core Flask application. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with Flask, Flask is a very lightweight profile, uh, a lightweight framework for creating web applications. And what I really like about Flask is the fact that it just gets out of the way. It does something very, very simple and does it very, 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 very well. That's why I love Flask. And so what I've got here is I've got a little HTML template here that's going to allow somebody to upload an image. And when they upload that image, we're then going to display out whatever text is on there. And we're also going to add in the alt text. Now, I want to highlight right here, there's my alt text. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Flask, don't worry too much about this. But basically, that's a dynamic placeholder. So eventually that's gonna be replaced by something dynamic. I'm gonna, I'm gonna set that value dynamically. So I'm basically just trying to show the fact that there's nothing up my sleeves except for my arms here. Okay, so now let me come back over here to oops, my app.py file. And let's walk through what we've got. You should recognize all of that. In fact, if I come back over here to my console.py, it's almost identical. 
there's a couple of additional items in here. Things like um, base 64, we actually don't need this um, uh, level request, but there's um, things like base 64, and that's just needed because of what we're doing with the image. Um, eventually you're gonna see that we're gonna be generating a way to display the image on the web page, and we just need a couple of extra tools for that. You're also gonna notice that we've got a little bit of code for Flask, and this is what's gonna make the magic of our web application happen. We're then going to set up our Flask application and we're gonna set up one core root, basically our index. Basically this is where it's gonna go when you open up the, um, uh, open up the page. We're gonna to look to see, hey, are you just simply using the, the get verb? So basically you're just accessing the page for the first time. If so, we're just gonna display a bit of placeholder. If you're uploading an image, however, then we're gonna go ahead and grab that image. We're going to, and again, don't worry too much about this, but we're going to just generate dynamically a URL that can be used to then display the image on the page. The only reason that that code is there is strictly for my web application. So again, if you're looking at that and going, hey, you know what, Christopher, I don't get it. Don't sweat that at all. That's all right. Okay, we're gonna reset the image. Now, this right here is gonna be the important part. This is now where we're going to set up exactly what we had before to go get the text from the image and to generate the caption for the image. And in fact, you know what I can do? I can actually just come right back over here and just do a little bit of copy and paste here. So let's go ahead and create a new function here. So I'm gonna say def, um, and I want to uh, generate caption, my image and my client. And then let's paste all of that in. And I don't want the tags. I just want the caption and I don't want to print it. I just want to return that back. Cool. So just like that, a couple lines of code, I've now set up automatic alt text, computer generated automatic alt text. Now what I wanna do is I mean, wanna read the text that's in the picture. And again, I'm just gonna come back over here and do a real quick copy and paste. So let's say def and I want um, extract text from image, the image and my client. And then let's go ahead and do a real quick paste. And now what I wanna do is just a little bit of extra work here. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, so here's what I want you to notice is I'm now just setting up a list in Python and then I'm just adding on every single line that we found and returning that back. So all of this is now going to be passed into that HTML for automatic display. So let's run my application here, flask run, and then let's go ahead and open this up, boom. Okay. Give me one second here. Talk amongst yourselves. I will give you a topic. The Industrial Revolution was neither industrial nor a revolution. Discuss. Okay, cool. So here is our neat little uh, web page that we've set up. And so what you're gonna notice, there's a little button right here that says upload photo. I'm gonna click on that. 
And then I'm gonna go ahead and upload this photo here, hit open. And now what we should see here, if I've done my code correct, we're coding live here. So there's always a non-zero chance of failure. Looks like everything worked, so that's good. So what you're gonna notice is sure enough, it's now printing out chance, which is exactly what we saw on the image here. And then what you'll also notice if I do a real quick F12 and I select the image, there's that alt text of a sign in front of a building. And this will work on really any image. So here's just um, uh, another picture of um, uh, winners from, uh, from a hackathon. We'll just give this a second here to upload and to do its thing. Chugga, chugga, chugga. And, ah, oh, I know what it is. Um, the image is too big. Um, yeah, there is a uh, size restriction, um, which I completely forgot about. That's all right, though. Let me go ahead and uh, make that a bit smaller. There we go. Okay, so what you're gonna notice here is it's trying its best to pick up the text that's on the image and you'll notice the automatically generated alt text, which happens to be a person in front of a red curtain. So again, you know, not perfect, but is could, could this qualify as a good enough if we've got nothing else? Yes, absolutely. Again, for alt text, it's always best to make sure that you have a, um, uh, that you have human generated alt text. It's always going to be best if you do it that way. But failing that, if for whatever reason you are going to need to use um, computer generated, um, then this is a way that, um, uh, a way that you can do that. Cool. Now, let me close all of this uh, by highlighting the fact that um, everything that you saw here is part of what we do with our uh, reactor workshops. Um, this is actually a very small portion of what's inside of the AI course. So I would definitely recommend going in, playing around with this, and seeing really more of the power of uh, cognitive services. So if you wanna do things like translation and otherwise, this will actually walk you through all of that. So you can go in and, um, and see that. I also wanna highlight um, the cognitive services. And again, you can bring this up just by, you know, using your favorite search engine, just doing a real quick call out for um, computer vision. Uh, Azure, and then find this little page. And then you'll also notice that there is a free trial. So if you've never used Azure before, um, you can actually get a free $200 to go in and, um, and play with that. Cool. Well, with that, it is now uh, five o'clock my time. That's the top of the hour. Um, what I am... Um, now going to do is I'm going to sign off from here. However, um, if you do have questions, I'm very happy to answer those questions. So please feel free to, um, uh, to keep asking questions. I'm very happy to, um, uh, uh, to answer. Um, is there an actual AI course? Yep, there is. Um, so that's all uh, well and good there. Um, I thank everybody for uh, joining today. And the last thing that I'm gonna say is the best way to learn all of this is to, to get out and to actually start writing code. Find something that you can uh, play around with and, uh, and go check it out. Thanks again for, uh, for tuning in.